the next session, and this will be, um, this is going to wrap up, and I actually am pretty, um, sort of quite excited about the opportunity here because a lot of times we go through and we get some con tremendous contribution around some of the things in the future, the research and there, but at the end of the day, for a lot of the people that are in the room, it's about delivering at farm level. So I'm going to introduce Brad Aiken from, um, to give us an insight about what has perhaps changed from a service provider perspective. And Brad um, is um, based out of Gippsland. He's been involved in uh, the dairy industry about 30 odd years. So. Um, and involved in the levels of uh, a wholesale level and also in the last 12 years of the family-owned business of Leading Edge Genetics. So Leading Edge um, is part, is probably reflects Brad's goals to, to take the service provision to a, a really high level from a farm to the farmer perspective. And that's been done in a number of different ways through mating programs, on-farm competitions, um, just really ensuring that um, people get as much information in, in their work and what they're doing. Brad um, actually started an interest in the industry at a young age with um, taking a few heifers to a show to get involved and then he did um, a little bit of um, work with VAB back in his school holidays as a youngster and ran into people like Rob Dirks and Jimmy Conroy, Pete Williams and also the late Laurie Wells. So there seems at times to be a pretty, um, a, a fairly consistent group of people that have mentored a lot of people in this industry. So I would like to um, welcome Brad to the stage to give us that, that update. Thanks, Graeme. Um, certainly, I'm um, quite humbled actually to be here today. Um, Graeme called me a few times, and I said, oh, "I'm not sure if I really want to reintroduce the wheel." And but I had a bit of a think about it, and I, I mean, I'm a very passionate for our industry. I've been fortunate that um, it's providing a living for 30 years, and um, so I'm just going to what I'm going to do. It's going to sort of be three parts. It's a little bit of a brief background on our business, just some areas in our industry that have, we, we talk about regularly, like sex semen and then where the industry looks like going forward in the future. And I'm, I will probably approach some subjects that might prickle a few, but anyway, let's go. Um, so um, our business was established in um, 2010. Um, we currently service 220 clients across Gippsland and, um, and the Western Districts. We um, phenotypically assess or herd evaluate 35,000 cows annually. Um, of which of those 35,000, 8 to 10,000 would be heifers. Um, it's a bit of a passion of mine, and um, we certainly spend a lot of time out in the field. Um, in the peak of our joining season, um, we have a staff of 12, um, from semen packers to, uh, to bookkeepers to um, assistance with um, data entry to um, technicians and a couple of salespeople. Um, this is probably the big thing that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that go and visit farmers and um, sell semen, but to me it's a lot more than that, and it always has been. It's more than just selling semen. And um, we, um, in my previous life from CMEX, um, I was involved with getting the CMEX on-farm competition up and going, which is now, would be the largest of its kind in Australia, if not in the world. And so when we started our business uh, 12 years ago, um, I took upon myself, I suppose, to you know, there's a lot of great cows out there that no one ever sees in commercial herds. And there's a lot of other people out there that do something similar to me. And the first cow, I'm not Trevor, are you here, Trevor? He is, there we go. Trevor, this is our 2020 uh, champion on, on farm cow. And this is a butter cow actually owned by Trevor Henry there. So last year we ran that competition. We were able to make it work with COVID and we had um, just over 400 head entered from 58 farms across Gippsland. It's a bit of a passion of mine and to see the thrill, and I know Trevor was thrilled to see the thrill of people getting presented with cows or awards, should I say, for a, a place getting in, in Trevor's case, champion cow is, a, is something you always remember. One of the things we've regularly done is we do newsletters. Um, after each proof round, April, August and December, we do a newsletter and that what that does is that gives us a real brief to our clients on what's happening on the bullfront. Um, we've 
ran, we do them at three a year, so we've done 33 of them and we'll do another one after the April proofs. And that's just something we do uh, internally. We also use Facebook and being used as a form of um, getting that out to the public. Mating programs, I mean, this is one of my favourite photos ever. And um, this is actually for, for, um, for the geneticists out there. This is actually a Ginfo herd. Um, this is uh, Bonnie View Pastoral. And to me, this is one of the great photos. This is the best photo I've ever taken. And it was at six o'clock in the morning. Um, might have been a bit later, might have been 6.30. We'd evaluated the heifers. The sun came up, we put the hose on, we threw a bit of grain down, and that's the photo we got. And um, to me, I think for us in the AI industry, if we can breed groups of heifers that consistent, um, we think we're getting somewhere. Farmer tours, we've run a lot of farmer tours. COVID restricted us last year. We were going to Northern America, but we've taken farmers to Europe, gone to Northern America twice. We've gone to Moxie Farms. Uh, we've gone up to Rib Milk, we've run far, and also in the Western District. So we, and we had great participation on those trips. We get 40 to 50 quite often will come with us on those trips. We also have had, uh, I think we've had five elite dairy sales. It's a, a forum for our clients to sell, um, to elite, sell their elite genetics and, um, you know, a bit of exposure. And we also run a lot of industry updates, as I say here, and whether that's refresher AI schools, whether that's uh, nutritionists coming talking about um, pre and post breeding in terms of nutrition. Something we, 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 we're here to try and, I'm no expert, I'm just a forum to, to um, get people to learn a little bit more about, um, to make the place uh, more efficient. So in social media, we're not on Instagram or Twitter, but we do use Facebook and we find Facebook a great avenue for videos. I mean, I love taking videos of cows out in the, far, out in the field or sorry, in the yards more often than not. And it's a great way for the wholesalers to also see their product out there. Um, I mean, I know I chuck the hose on them, but generally as a rule, they're, they're in there working close. So we, we, and we get really good following on, on that, like extremely good. I think when we did the on-farm, I think there was one video I got watched, I think it was five or 6,000 times, which is quite remarkable. Obviously, some of that would be international and, and someone in India, but um, it was... Um, <laughs> Sex semen. I was involved with bringing sex semen. I was involved. I worked uh, for 21st Century Genetics and with Daryl Brown, who's one of the great entrepreneurs, and Brian Leslie, who, and that, they taught me a lot. And we, sex semen, I was involved with doing the talks all around Australia um, with sex semen. And Pixton Shaker was the first bull. James Mann's here. And James will well remember um, his past business partner, Gary Spain and James and me were on landline in 2004, I reckon, when the first sex semen cars were born in Australia. There was another herd in Gippsland by the name of Alan and Holstein's, the Costa family that also um, had a few calves and that was interesting times. I mean, if we look back, the initial product was 0.8 to 1.2 million sperm. Um, and today, uh, sorry, the product was pricey. I think there was four bulls, Courier, Shaker, Principal and Sene, I think were the four bulls. And the product was pricey. Um, I reckon that was ranging between 100 and 125 dollars. Uh, we now get purity in 4M. I mean, we're, to give you an idea on our business, we're 25.8% on sex semen sales in 2020. We envisage that. We're not sure if we'll get to 30, but the way the market looks at the moment, we do think there's another 2 or 3% left in it. But we do a lot of research on our sex semen bulls. There's, in my opinion, I'm, there's sex semen and there's sex semen. And we do pay a lot of attention to the SCR, um, whether it's a domestic SCR and semen fertility or an international one. We do think that can be the difference between, between having a, um, a favourable or a pleasing result and um, perhaps a disappointing result. But um, And the ABS XL product, I thought I would mention, I'm not sure if any of the ABS crew are still here, but um, XL is uh, a product that we're getting some favourable reports and um, it's early days, but um, conception and um, heifertable ratio certainly look like they're heading in the right direction. This is just a bit of a brief overview of just doses of sex semen sold. That'll be 16, 17, as you understand, 17, 18 down the bottom. So 321,000 doses of sex were sold in Australia, the 1920 financial year. Proven versus genomic. You know, it's a common conversation. I mean, the Holstein International is one of the great magazines and they write some interesting things in their forwards and I think everyone in the industry should read the Holstein International. For the Holstein breeders, that is. The Jersey breeders like Trevor might shoot me down here. But for the Holstein breeders, it is really a great... Uh, independent forum to learn a bit about where the industry is heading. You know, I'm, I'm a bit of a, I really think there is some substandard bulls marketed in Australia on genomics. 
and um, most are very, very, very good. But history says those bulls in that top echelon will be the bulls at the end of the day will return to proof and will be um, that farmers will be pleased with. So I think it's really important, important as service providers as I am that we um, that we make it known that it's better to pick a bull like that. To pick a bull that is low, that is say got good front teeth placement for God's sake. I mean, and he's a 2100 TPI or he's a 150 BPI bull. I actually think you're doing your farmer a disservice. So it's really important that we we do work with those top echelon of bulls. Daughter fertility, and uh, John Morton made a very, it was interesting, I looked at that graph, and we've been talking to farmers in the last two or three weeks that have been um, getting their conception rates back. They've been doing their um, spring uh, um, pregnancy testing. There's no doubting that daughter fertility has improved markedly in the Holsteins, no doubting. And the one bull, and Trevor Henry's here, and he would have had more O-mans in Australia than anyone at one stage, he has been one of the catalysts for improving daughter fertility in the Holsteins. And, and the amount of size, or now great, great, great size, I would well imagine that a feature O-man in the pedigree, and the improvement to the bottom line that that bull has made is really unsurpassed. Um, type, there's no doubting type is the most accurate component when it comes to the genomic profile. I mean, I see it all the time. Type will, the type profiles of bulls will um, end up pretty close when the daughter progeny are added into the proofs. There's no doubting. Then I work, my personal opinion, and the geneticists might shoot me down. Um, Graham, can you just give me a glass of water, please? Um, the next part of it would be the, the working components, your milk and speed temperament, daughter fertility, and then uh, production just does seem to vary a bit. But if you want good type or you've got a really an area in your herd you want to address, then certainly um, that's um, pretty accurate. Thank you. And this is a really good point. And in the Holstein International two or three issues ago, reliably proven bulls generally represent good buying, and they damn well do. And you can buy some really good bulls for $20 to $25 that you know, you already know what you're going to get. So to me, it's the ratio you work with. Some people, we've got clients that use 100% proven. I've got clients that use 100% genomic. But reliably proven bulls do represent good buying. This is interesting, if you just look at this graph, we just put this together, this just gives you the movement. So the purple being the proven bulls, um, the, the lighter blue being the genomic bulls, and, and the PT, um, the green line down the bottom. You'll find that the 1% in 2019, 20 would, have, um, would be just some, um, some of the minor breeds that wouldn't have had genomic figures. So that gives you a bit of an idea. So basically the market at the moment is 57%. Um, 57% uh, uh, genomic and um, that's actually not quite right. There's a mistake down the bottom there. There you go. So it's 57% genomic and 42% proven. So what is our 2021 dairy farmer looking for? Moderate stature with, a, with adequate strength. There's no doubting that extreme stature does lead to infertility. Um, I don't, need, don't think we need little short squatty cows, but certainly finding a midway point seems to be the, the ability to compete and still having enough capacity is to me is paramount, but you know, I still think we've got to be mindful of stature. SCR, this is to me one of the most, I think we've really come a long way with daughter fertility, like extremely long way, but semen fertility, there are so many people now that have got concentrated joining periods that semen fertility on bulls is paramount. And I've been thinking about this and I might have said to Anthony Shelley or Peter Thurn this morning, I reckon I've got quarter of a million to half a million AI dockets at my place. I shouldn't say dockets, inseminations recorded sitting in boxes. That information has never gone into the system. I mean, how good would that be? I, I mean, there's Jared Daniels, there's the Heiko crew here, and Christian and his mob. I'm sure they've got the same boxes in some cases sitting at their place with lots of AI dockets. I mean, semen fertility with concentrated joinings now has such an impact. I mean, I study a lot of data, and there's no doubting that those bulls with those, the extremes of semen fertility um, um, have a, certainly have a great impact. I also think there's going to be more concentrated joinings. I think this is going to continue to happen. Um, dairy, beef, sex, semen. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure the service providers would all say the same thing. That's where, where the market is heading. And dairy, beef may be used on those cows, first heated cows, poor fertility cows, lesser cows, and sex, semen on the more fertile cows. You know, 
with the sex semen, you need to do, it's not a blanket mating with sex semen. I honestly think if you use a bull that's got good SCR, 4M or 2M with really good SCR, and you use it selectively on your herd, you will get pretty close to conventional conception. I was at a herd the other day, it was only 300 inseminations, roughly 150 sexed and 150 conventional. And do you know his sex semen was 2% better than his conventional semen? But, mind you, he had used it selectively across his herd. It's fair to say he'll use sex semen again this year. Market trends, um, polled and A2. Well, I've got some issues with polled. I mean, I did a bit of a look the other day. Only 1% of the top 500 bulls in the US and Canada carry the poll gene, 1%, which is insignificant. And for all the money that's been invested around the world in nucleus herds buying elite females, um, the problem I have with polled is I, I love the idea of having polled. What I don't like is the sacrifices we make for polled. And one is, is production. And Beth Scott, I, I had a little, I asked her a little question the other day. She'll do some research for me. And I said, you know, do polled matings differ much from parent average? In other words, we, we don't seem to be getting the extremes. I love the idea of polled, and it's a no brainer. A2, 50% of the semen sold in Australia is A2. Um, but what we've got to remember is not everyone, that doesn't mean that the bulls have been selected because they had A2, because that could be obviously purely coincidental. We don't really have a real great gauge on what the A2 percentage of, but it might be 20%. I know in Gippsland, to the best of my knowledge, and there's a couple of Gippslanders here, I don't think there's anyone sending A2 milk in Gippsland. So what does 2025 and beyond look like? Could a sire have an SCR before they've even made semen? Is that possible? I mean, that's something that I think smarter people than me that will look at in the foreseeable future. I mean, to me, that is a great interest. A growth in sex male beef semen, I really see that happening. And um, we're already starting to see it happening. We're very, very fortunate in Australia. We have sex sorting machines here in Australia uh, with GA slash TLG. And to me, I really think that's going to be a growth market, the greater mass of the male. Could all manufacturers be, uh, be chasing A2? Um, Again, that's possible. Um, and will there no longer be a direct line for unwanted calves? And um, who knows in the foreseeable future. So these are just a couple of little areas I think we need to address. Um, and it was great to hear Steph Bullen talking about the AI technicians. I mean, what I think is going to happen, there's more people getting collars, ear tags. Um, I know in our cells we run an AM, PM, now AI service, and we think that will increase substantially. There's a lot of people investing money in technology, and we have a shortage of AI technicians. And if if the industry as a whole can collectively get together and you know get more techs, the other thing, and Brian Dixon will fall off his perch here, but I did say to Brian, I think AI is too cheap, and you know we're dealing with people that are specialised. They're working at 6 o'clock on a Sunday morning, we're all tucked in bed, and they're working at 6 o'clock plugging someone's cows. I honestly think that AI is too cheap. Um, Jared Daniels to my left, I mean, he would recount these pricing variation from 25 years ago to now, but I'm thinking it hasn't gone up with inflation, Jared. So I think that really that, that AI technicians need to be paid more and the industry needs to support that. Um, we need to improve terminology on bulls. I talked to Vaughan Johnson about this before and he brought up about the Angus and, you know, you might see a catalogue and it'll say the bull's a front T placement improver. I mean, so what? He might be 101 in Australia or he might be 0.6 in the US. I'd like to see percentages used, percentiles, like is he in the top 1% or a 99 percentile bull? I mean, I honestly, it just gives the end customer um, a real good feel that he knows or they know that they're going to get some significant improvement in those particular traits. I have a little bit of a thing about robots as well. We see and nothing against the CMEX boys, but the robot ready thing or anyone that uses terminology on robots. I mean, we have more and more robots every day. Positioning of rear teats and length of teat is paramount. And we see bulls that are recommended to be used on robots that have got short teats and close rear teats. And <laughs> that dumbfounds me. Anyway, that's just an area I think we need to work on. Data. Well, um, data, Australia is lagging behind the European and North American counterparts by a long way. Um, you know, I think, I did talk to Peter Thurman, we were talking about it this morning, I mean, 
I reckon probably, uh, well, when I was at GA, did some work with VAB back in those days in 86, you know, they were probably looking at 10 to 1 ratio, 10 straws to one straw, one daughter, um, milk recorded. I mean, we may be far out as 25 to 40 straws now. The thing that's holding us back is data, because at the end of the day, if someone from ABS is promoting a bull and he's got 30, I'm just using this as example, ABS too, I'm not sure if they're here, 30 daughters and 15 herds and he's the number one bull and we all go out and use him. You know, how often, and there's people been around for a while now, how often have we seen those bulls, you know, fail to meet their expectations when a whole heap of second a second, the second group of progeny come in. We really need to work on data. I mentioned before about AI dockets, but you know we are lacking a lot of information. Uh, Trevor Saunders mentioned very, very much so before about uh, inline milk meters. The amount of farmers that have inline milk meters. I mean, I get farmers will come to me with them. We have a clipboard. We're evaluating, and I'll say this heifer's doing 27 liters, and she's by, I don't know, Atley or Medellin. Doesn't really matter. And I'll say. You have got it entered on the system. No, no. You know, we're losing so much data. That's it. Thank you. Now, um, there are there is a question there, um, or is that a that? I mean, Brad, oh yeah, Brad, do you think MIR fertility predictions could be paired with semen fertility to make a difference to overall reproductive performance? Steph, that's a bit above me. Um, uh, well, all I'll say, Steph, is that daughter fertility has come a long way, but semen fertility is the next... I'm not sure where I... Where are you, Steph? You're out there somewhere? Oh, just there. <laughs> but I, still, I do think that semen fertility... I mean, that's a little bit above me, but... Um, we have come a long way with daughter fertility. Like, I was at three herds I talked to, so it would have been Friday. We're looking at 8 and 10% empty rates now. So we're, we're getting somewhere. And the next step, in my opinion, is semen fertility. Um, and I think we're getting the cows the right size, the right shape um, to suit Australian conditions. OK. Well, at that, I'm going to um, take this opportunity to thank Brad for his um, contribution here today. And I think there's a number of things that um, got wrapped up in that and it all came back to at the dairy farm level on the delivery of that, um, the different services that we provide. So thanks, Brad. Thanks, Brad. Thank you.